Hi, and welcome to the Critical Issues Series. I'm here with David Craig, the CFO of CBA. Now, David, I just want to ask you, the RBA cut rates again this month after its long easing cycle. I'm just interested in what this cycle is telling you about the economy at the moment. Well, clearly, I, I think the Governor of the Reserve Bank, Glenn Stevens, made it pretty clear that uh, Australians, the average Australian, is doing it tough. Mm. Uh, confidence isn't great in the economy. Uh, obviously, the high Australian dollar is putting pressure on many households, and so you know, a mixture of all those things uh, is it sees a continuation of what's been quite a long cycle of rate cuts. And I think there's a flag there that there may indeed be, be more to come. So the other thing they touched on this month was Japan, and I guess alluding to the uh, lots of stimulus that a lot of central banks are putting out there. Mm. I'm wondering if you see any longer term risks to both the global economy and our economy from this? Look, there, there's absolutely no doubt, and this is what's been playing through really through most of the sort of global financial crisis, is that we are at the end of, end of a long global dog and we're just the tail that gets wagged around a bit. Uh, so while our economy has remained actually pretty healthy throughout the whole cycle, um, clearly the things that happen elsewhere in the world have a significant influ influence on us. And, you know, all that liquidity sloshing around has had impacts, uh, you know, on, on Australian companies and, and of course, on the, on the stock markets. And interestingly, you know, a side effect of ever decreasing interest rates is that uh, money then looks for a higher yield and mm -hmm. one of the reasons that um, high dividend stocks in Australia and internationally have been bid up is because there's all this liquidity um, and low interest rates and so people are looking for places to plant their money that give a reasonable yield. Yeah, that, that's been a real topical issue, hasn't it? Mm, it um, has. And the banks and shareholders have benefited a lot from that. The banks have been one of the beneficiaries. Obviously, any company like Telstra that has a high dividend yield has also been a beneficiary. That's right. The other, the other issue with all this money around in markets seems to be that it's reduced uh, interest rates in a lot of different funding markets. And I guess for the banks have enjoyed a, a d decrease in the cost in their wholesale funding markets. So can you give us an update? on what you've seen over the last, particularly last even three months in, in wholesale markets? Yeah, the, look, the wholesale markets, we, again, the high interest rates uh, were a function of volatility and, in effect, distrust between financial intermediaries. Mm -hmm. So as the global economies have settled, and as you say, there's been much greater liquidity in the market, then that's seen uh, a general return towards the base rates of wholesale interest rates that were there before the GFC. They're not yet down to those levels. Um, as far as the banks are concerned, the follow-on from that is that, of course, we fund, our, we seek our very long-term wholesale money from the international markets. That's five-year money generally, and so we only borrow in five-year markets when we're rolling off old five-year uh, loans. Yeah. So the old five-year loans are still cheaper than the new five-year loans today. There, and so we're still seeing an increase in our average cost of funding as the last of the cheap money rolls off and is replaced by today's money. Now, fortunately, today's money is nonetheless cheaper than it was six months ago. So mm. the trend is right. And what this means in our wholesale, the, the wholesale part of our book, is that if rates stay where they are now for another six months or so, we'll finally reach the peak of getting rid of the old cheap money and we'll start to see our wholesale funding costs coming down. The other side of the equation, though, that's, that's 30, in our case, about 36% of our funding. 64% mm. of our funding comes from retail customers. And as you would know, in mm. the Australian market, there's been a lot of bidding up of deposits um, because of the new liquidity rules and for a number of other reasons. Banks are keen to hold lots of um, t local Australian deposits. Mm. And so those have remained very expensive relative to, it's much, much cheaper to borrow in the international markets in wholesale than it is to borrow from you um, in your term deposit account. So you've been a beneficiary, mm. um, as, as have the Australian uh, public, on that side of the book. I, and I guess the banks are being almost forced to build up their retail deposits due to the, new, the new Basel III That's right. um, regulations. Um, I, I know w this year so far we've already seen APRA rule on certain aspects of that. So what's next in terms of those regulations for the banks? Well, um, the, the regulations, what APRA has come out, in fact, this week with mm. the, the update on those rules and what they've clarified is that while the Baal Three Committee has 
stalled the implementation of the global liquidity rules till mm -hmm. 2019. APRA has said, no, the original rules were 2015. We think the Aussie banks will be there by 2015, so we're going to stick with the original timetable. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did on capital as well. And so what that means is we're required to get to be fully compliant, obviously by the 1st of January 2015, which is now only 18 months away. And so we're required to be building up towards that at that time, and, mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously what all the banks are doing. Yeah, and, but is there something on, on your sort of mind that will be once you pass that? You know, what, what's sort of next beyond the LCR rules? Uh, well, there's, a, there's another thing called a net stable funding ratio, mm. which is the next, which is also about, you know, having more stable funding in the long term. So we've got to move towards that. That's a 2019 date. And of course, uh, as you know, theoretically from, again, 1st of January 2015, the mm. Bar 3 Capital rules are in for the Australian banks. Again, the international banks don't have to get there till 2019. But the Aussie banks are there now, so we've all built up you know, copious amounts of capital. Uh, and look, the good news about this is clearly the Australian banking system is very safe, uh, safe and stable and the banks are very well capitalised and they have lots of liquidity. The less good news about this is there's a cost to that. And mm. of course, part of you know, the drive on you know, the cost of funding has been the fact that we've got to be that much safer and that much more stable and having higher capital all those things push uh, the cost of lending up slightly. Mm. And I, I guess like a lot of sectors in the economy the banks have really focused on productivity and improving efficiencies and simplifying. Mm. Um, I'm just interested in your take on what stage you're at with that given CBA has you know perhaps been an advantage by upgrading the core system which is almost complete of their technology. So, I mean, where, whereabouts are you, Adam, and what, what further gains can you get there? Well, this is a never-ending story. I mean, frankly, I think, it, and the banks are no different to virtually any other business uh, these days. Mm. We're all in a global market. We're competing globally for everything that we do. Um, Long-term net interest margins have been coming down for a very, very long time. And the banks, plural, um, productivity has been improving over that time, and it has to keep improving. I, the way technology is moving, and uh, the impacts of technology, both in terms of the opportunity it provides us to become more productive ourselves, but also if we don't, that the risk that some interloper, some outside uh, provider will you know, come in with a new technology solution that'd be dramatically cheaper. All of these things say, you've just got to keep uh, getting more and more and more efficient. Now the good news about that, from my perspective, is in general when you get more efficient it's actually better for your customers as well. Mm -hmm. Because what it means is you've found a way to do things faster and cheaper for your customers and so that has the advantage that uh, you, know, you can provide the service more quickly and more reliably. So there is a win, usually this productivity thing comes in my mind with a win-win. It's not as if you're just in fact cutting service, you can't afford to do mm -hmm. that, but rather you're making that service more efficient. Is there a stage though that the banks do need credit growth to pick up? Uh, I think there's an almost universal view in the banking sector that it won't return to pre-GFC levels, but uh, there seems to also be an argument that there's only so much, uh, I guess, productivity you can get and eventually you need some credit growth. Is, is that a fair sort of assumption? Uh, I don't know that I'd agree with that. I mean, from my point of view, we are here as the servants of the economy. I mean, basically, and we can't do that much better than mm. the economies in which we operate. And if this economy is in a quieter time, which it absolutely is at the moment, then we've just got to learn to live within that. So uh, to be honest, I mean, at the moment, uh, credit growth is around 4%. Mm. Well, that's 4%. That's yeah. not dead. That's not going backwards as it is in some other countries. So I think we're in a you know reasonably fortunate position that we're in a healthy economy. Um, y you, you would know that credit uh, arrears and so on, all, all the signs of uh, problem accounts and so on are diminishing. There are fewer bankruptcies, there are fewer com companies going into liquidation, which is good, um, but it also means uh, that there are fewer people borrowing at the moment, they're being mm. safe, they're playing it carefully, they're paying off their debt. Well, that's good from our point of view because we have lower bad debts, but it also means that um, the credit growth isn't there and therefore our revenue growth isn't as strong. So we've just got to make sure that we cut our cloth according to that. It really just means that because we're growing slowly, clearly we have to make sure that our expenses don't grow any faster than that. Mm. We can't put on staff 
uh, faster than we've got work for them to do. Of course, yeah. And uh, you brought up bad debts. I, I think one of the banks this month reported, I think, a, a low point since I think 2006 in their bad debt charge. But the overall impairment of assets was still at pre-GFC levels, I think two or three times. So does that suggest that in the next cycle we might see a high level provisioning across the bank sector? No, not necessarily. It w impairments or impaired assets are a, are a lagging indicator. Mm. So basically, once uh, a company goes broke, it goes into this impaired bucket, you've then got to uh, liquidate it. Mm. And so it sits there in that statistic steady. You've provided for it and expensed the cost of it at the first instant that it had a problem. Mm. But it might take three or four years before it actually gets liquidated and that balance goes away. Right. But it's already fully provided for. So the, as I said, the impaired assets is a lagging indicator. The charge in the profit and loss is a, a leading or hopefully totally current indicator. Mm. And I think what you're seeing with all of the banks is the impaired assets are declining slowly, but they're not yet down to the pre-GFC level. Yeah. But on the other hand, the PL is saying, well, actually, there's no new problems. Because what the PL is indicating is what's new, what's happening right now, and what do we expect to happen going forward. Mm. So you're fairly confident with your, with your lending books at the moment? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, the lending books are in, a, in very good shape. And this is because um, people are paying off debts, people are being cautious. Uh, people are being conservative about the way they're funding their businesses. Mm. And, and I guess just on the subject of growth, uh, CBA has recently uh, made an invest or upped its investment in um, Aussie. Mm -hmm. And um, there has been some talk the banks you know, may look at acquisitions for growth, uh, but I think some of them have pointed out there's just not a lot of opportunities out there. Is, is that still what CBA is saying? Oh yeah, look, I mean, we, we've only, we, I mean, we bought Bankwest some years ago, mm. we bought a small stake in Aussie, some years ago, we've now we've that's been a good investment for us. So we've taken a, a slightly higher stake now, up to eighty uh, percent. But these are that's a very small acquisition, obviously. Mm -hmm. And from our point of view, you know, it's unlikely that we're going to acquire anything meaningful in the Australian market. Mm -hmm. I think we're sort of at our, our limits in that sense. And internationally, we've we've said that we'd be interested in buying, uh, you know, the right bank at the right price in the Indonesian market, for example, but the reality is, A, they're not for sale, and B, if they were, uh, they're certainly not at a price that we'd be willing to pay for them. So, you know, most of our growth, I think, will continue to come as it has historically, uh, organically. And, you know, we believe that if we can give great customer service and get our offerings right um, and have great customer satisfaction and be there at a reasonable price, then, you know, we'll, we'll sell out a fair share of business and continue to grow that way. Mm, and I guess the, the Australian market has been a very profitable market for the banks, but others, there's still this hope that um, Asia can provide quite a lot of growth as well. But you've got to manage the, the I guess, the returns versus the growth environment, don't you, with Asia? Yes, and look, and, and we, are, we are growing in Asia and have been for many, many years. We don't tend to talk about it too much because, you know, a dollar of investment today in Asia won't pay off for 10 years. So there's no point in getting everybody excited, uh, you know, I've, oh, look, I've bought this thing in Asia today, you know, isn't it fantastic? Because, you know, yes, fortunately, some of our long-term shareholders will live to see the day, but, you know, those who report on the thing look to see, well, tell us what, what's happening with that Asian investment you had, mm -hmm. and the answer will be, it'll be a slow payback. It'll be a good payback. I think that Asia is growing rapidly. I think there's lots of natural affinity for Australia doing business in Asia and for us particularly to follow our corporate customers who are doing business in Asia. Uh, so we are growing there and you know, my, my head of international banking would assure me, assure me and you that we're growing double digit. So the rate of growth is very fast, but it's off an incredibly low base. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a nice to have. Uh, it's a place we definitely need to continue to do business, but um, don't get excited about a very short term payback. Mm. But I guess the region uh, does put Australia in good stead. I yes. guess looking out for the next maybe even two or three decades, doesn't mm. it? Uh, absolutely. And look, I think any any business needs to be very mindful and very aware of uh, Asia and the opportunity, and needs to be you know, particularly supporting our own Australian companies that are doing business there, and for that matter, the Asian companies that are wanting to do business with Australia. It's a natural trade flow, and I think as well as that, um, you know, there are certain competencies that Australians have uh, and that Australian financial institutions have that can benefit um, emerging um, Asian markets. And so that's, again, one of the areas that we're trying to support. Mm. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, David. Thank you very much. Pleasure to chat.